We can die. Pistol now uh, in, ch in chapter 3. Um, if I haven't met you before, my name is Tom, a uh, fellow elder slash pastor here with Vic. Um, to the rest of us, great to see you. Always a blessing to be in the house of God with you. Uh, and we've been going through this epistle of Titus, uh, written, of course, uh, from Paul the Apostle to Titus, who is a young uh, ministry protege that he sent over to the island of Crete. Uh, which was a, a little uh, debaucherous, sinful island for retirees and college students. And it was just a, a, a city of sin. But yet the gospel went there and flourished. And there was house churches, but there was no order. There was false teaching. There was still sin. There was, there was bickering. The culture had really infiltrated the church or had rather it had not yet been purged from the church. And so Paul sends Titus to uh, get elders in place, get preaching happening get the false teachers out of there and, and order these people rightly so that they can live under sound doctrine and also be living out good works. And that's been the main theme of the book. Sound doctrine, good works. Let it never be said, even though it is said, let it never be said with reason that those who preach and believe in the sovereignty and freeness of God's grace, that, that among us we don't preach also on good works, and, and that we believe in grace so we don't obey. That is, that is unfitting, that's inappropriate, it's unbiblical, it's unchristlike, and it's what the, the book of Titus focuses on. Sound doctrine, good, and good works, they go together. Not only do they go hand in hand as if they, they work best when they're together, they are ne necessarily combined for each to be what it truly is. It, it's not just like they're hand in hand, it, it's more like they are the lungs and the breath. They need one another. Without sound doctrine, good works are not actually good works. They're, they're misplaced, they're, they're coming from the wrong motives, they're, they're misinformed and they think wrongly about God. Uh, and, and, and likewise, without good works, sound doctrine is, is just knowledge that puffs up and lead, leaves us guilty. So we must have, under the grace of God, we receive the truth in sound doctrine and we live good works. This has been our repetition and, and, and we repeat it because Paul just repeats it throughout this epistle. We've kept on coming back to it because Paul keeps on coming back to it. Let, uh, let no one cry legalism here. We need to frame our, our emphasis on good works rightly. It's always from God's grace, not, not, because, uh, not to earn God's grace. We see over in, in verse 7, even though we preached on this a week ago, if you're reading the, the, the letter, it's, it's, it's almost in the same sentence of Paul. It, it, you read verse 7 and, and what we're reading today down in verse 14 about good works. Uh, this is only 30 seconds away from each other. Paul has these connected, but of course the grace of God comes first. In fact, if you read verse 7 and 8, you see these right next to each other. Verse 7, that we, are, we have been justified by his grace so that we may become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's justification and adoption into God's family by his sheer grace. Then the very next sentence, this saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. This is the breath and the lungs of true Christianity. They go absolutely together. And, and of course, this has been so repeated. We'll see back in chapter 1, verse 1, he says that, uh, that this truth, this gospel from God, Paul is saying, accords with godliness. 
Then later in the chapter, as he's talking about elders, who to appoint, he's saying that they must be leaders in good works. And then when he talks about false teachers, he says down in verse 16 of chapter 1, they're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. That, that's what makes them so false. They don't do good works. Then he'll say over in the very next verse, chapter 2, verse 1, teach what accords with sound doctrine. That is, teach them to do good works which accords with sound doctrine. Then he'll say in verse 7, which we just, uh, uh, which we, uh, when, when Titus, uh, Paul is talking to Titus specifically saying, show yourself in all respects a model of good works. Then he'll say in verse 14 that Jesus died to get himself a people who are zealous for good works. Then chapter 3, verse 1, verse 1, <clears throat> a Freudian slip, not this early in the morning, verse 1 of chapter 3, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, ready for every good work. Then verse 8, careful to devote themselves for every good work. Verse uh, uh, 14 now, this will be part of our portion this morning, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. It's true that the purpose of God's election of us in eternity past is never complete, has never arrived to its end goal until you and I are walking in good works. The, the reason that God chose us was that we might be conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8 says. This is true of every step of salvation. The, re, uh, uh, the reason he gave us faith is so that we would walk in good works. The reason that he sent Christ chapter 2 told us, was so that we would be zealous for good works. The reason he regenerated us was so that we would show the works of our Father. We see this uh, plainly in Ephesians chapter 2. This is a, this is a favorite verse to, to prove that we are saved by faith and not works. Chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 8 through 10, says that by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. Even this own faith, he's talking about. This faith is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. That's regeneration. You've been created anew for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we see that this is part of God's eternal purpose. Don't think that once you're regenerated, now it's sort of up to you to fill in the blanks and color in between the lines of, of what God is, God's finished work. This is as much his work in you as he is predestined to do as our faith, as our salvation, as sending Christ. And so today we find ourselves in verses 12 through to 15. So may you turn there in chapter 3, verse 12 through to 15. This is, this is some last remarks. You might read this and wonder how we can even get a sermon out of it. But if we squeeze hard, we'll get something. <clears throat> Verse 12 through to 15. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopo Nicopolis. I was practicing that all week. Do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to send Zenus the lawyer to speed Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. <clears throat> we're going to see today, the, uh, two, we're going to stay on this theme of good works and see how this, this applies to the gospel in our life. But I want us to see two things, the, the character of those who are doing the good works and the character of the good works themselves. So we're going to start now with the character of those who are doing good works. First look back at verse 8 of chapter 3. Verse 8 and verse 14 define for us the people who are doing the good works. Verse 8 says, So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And verse 14 says, Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. This, this being, this acting, this, this behavior, this changed lifestyle, it has to come from the originating work of God, which is, as we looked on over the last couple of weeks, regeneration. The, the created a new person in Christ Jesus. The miracle from heaven so that we're born again. 
after we've been justified by His grace, these are the people who are urged to live new lives in godliness, with good works. We, we can't confuse this and think that, and let ourselves ever fall into those, uh, those temptations to believe that we can in our own self, and maybe you're a sinner here this morning, and you don't know Jesus by faith in salvation. I'm not going to command you to do anything today. I have no list of commandments for you except for one. Believe in Jesus by faith. We have no Ten Commandments for you to tick off. We're not going to ask you to get yourself to a level and then present yourself to God with crossed fingers. You are not being commanded any of the things in the book of Titus except to believe on Jesus Christ. But those who have been born again, to us, we must be zealous, careful, devoted, learning to do good works. <clears throat> so we'll see back in, uh, back in the earlier verses of this own chapter, we are those who washed by the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Good water only flows out of a, a good, pure spring. Jesus said this. Uh, that, that good trees produce good fruits, bad trees produce bad fruits. Our heart is what has been changed first. Our heart is the source of these good works. <clears throat> and all of your doing, we, we remember this as Christians, because it keeps us from pride, and it keeps us from, from this pharisaical mindset that, that, that looks at our own doing and compares ourselves to the world. And you've got mates at work, or you've got family members, or you've got people you grew up with and, and friends of yours, and it's very simple to compare yourself to them and conclude that you're pretty moral and you're pretty good compared to the rest. But that is not the Christian mindset. That is not the Christian mindset. We must remember always that even right now, our hardest and best works, all of our doing is laid down at the foot of the cross. All of our deeds are dead at the cross. All of our striving is deceased at the cross of Jesus, and only by his blood and his spirit given can we do good, living, godly works. We are not better than anyone else. We are simply made alive by His grace. We must remember that. <clears throat> and sinners, of course, the, the, the commandments here don't apply to you in demand. They apply to you to, to help you see. If you're a sinner, maybe you're a teenager coming along with your parents, maybe you're a friend of somebody who's invited you. If you're here, you need to hear these commandments of righteousness and, and generosity and charity and all of these things. And what I do want you to do is, is not... See how you, you measure up and tick off boxes. I want you to see that you fall abysmally short. That you are dead if this, if this is life. You are evil if this is righteous. I want you to be hopeless this morning. I don't want to give to you any pats on the back or, or encouragements. I'm not Dr. Phil. I'm not Jordan Peterson. I'm here to tell you you're dead. There is no self-help. There, there is no way that you, this, this dead, dry bones who have been cremated by, by, by the fire of this world, you are hopeless unless God brings you to life. So realize today that you're guilty, you're sinful, you're dead, you're evil. Don't, don't try and pretty this up. You need Jesus Christ. He is the only one who has done good works. He's the only one that can bring you to a right standing with the Father. And that, that is our hope. That is the invitation to you today. Verse 3, that, that's where you're living your life. Back in chapter 3, verse 3. We ourselves were once, this is Christians, but, but you who are not yet saved, this is you currently, foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing your days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another, and, and don't hear judgment from us. We are the same. Us Christians have been there. We, are, we, we would still be there but by the grace of God. But you need to know that that's where you find yourself. And to, to come out of that and to, to escape the hell of eternal torment that God has promised to everyone who dies in that state, you must believe on Jesus Christ. That is our plea and our prayer. <clears throat> but let's keep on going. <clears throat> uh, uh, let, let me quote Spurgeon. He, he, I think he says this best. Wrapping up both of these, he says, To the sinner, that he may be saved, we say not a word concerning good deeds, except to remind him that he has none of them. To the believer who is saved, we say 10,000 words concerning good deeds, 
beseeching him to bring forth much fruit, that in this way he may be Christ's disciple. So find yourself in one of those baskets this morning. A disciple of Christ, saved by grace, who has on you an urgent uh, uh, de declaration and demand from your master in heaven to go and bear fruit. Or you are, you are still condemned, still unsaved, and to you, Jesus offers his free salvation. <clears throat> now we're going to look, though, <clears throat> at the, the character of the good works themselves. But, but, but let me, before we go there, I, just, I, I have a word here to speak of zeal. <clears throat> look at verse 14. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. Over in verse 8, we were told that we must be careful to devote ourselves to good works. Back in verse 14 of chapter 2, he said that we must be those who are zealous for good works. This is the, this is the character of, of those who are doing good works. We must have not a, not a, 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 a sense of, of calmness and drifting uh, a passivity about good works. Even though you're saved and, I know, you've got a new heart, and you're pretty close to perfection, I know, I know, but yet you still, that, that little bit of remaining sin is still enough to drag and drift you. If you're not active in fighting it, it will drag you towards condemnation and, and fruitless living and sin. We're, we're those who are, who are in a, a river. No one ever drifts upstream. And in this world with temptations and sin and culture and our own flesh, we naturally will always flow downstream. You will pick up the mindsets of your, your, your co-workers. You will pick up the opinions of your friends. You will, you will cave in to the persecution and the, and the strange looks you get and the, and the discouraging text messages and Facebook messages you get saying how, how they don't appreciate what you say or believe or, or say to them. But, but we need to constantly be an active devotion, zeal, careful fighting of that, that, that we may work upstream to the glory of God. And so we do not drift. We do not assume this will happen incidentally. But zeal here, zeal is, is that, that, that fire put in the bones of a man or woman that, that drives him to, to die for something. But if he doesn't need to die for it, then he will at least live for it. Zeal is, zeal is passion given from God. Uh, and one person zealous is better than 10,000 lukewarm Christians. By that, that heat becomes contagious. And, and by that zeal comes prayer. And, and it is able to, to work through a church. And, and, and leaven, in a, in a good sense, not as leaven is pictured as sin in the Old Testament, but, but it works through the people. Lukewarm multitudes do very little they do nothing. They work backwards for the kingdom. But one zealous person is able to see a town or even an island turned on its head. And we see this in Crete. This is where God, uh, the gospel went. We, we theorized it was probably just from Paul. When he docked there, while he was imprisoned on a ship, he docked there for a couple of nights and then left. And then the next thing we know, he needs to send somebody there to take care of all the Christians. Because this zealous, chained Paul could not keep his mouth shut to the glory of God. But a word of warning needs to come when we speak of zeal. Jonathan Edwards, he was, he was a, uh, a writer, a, 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 a professor, a Christian theo uh, a theologian and pastor in, in the Great Awakening in America. In the 1700s, and, and while he was seeing so much, so much revival, and people would, under his preaching, I don't know if you've ever heard "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." There's a, a recording of it on, not the original, right? But but a, a rereading and recording of it on YouTube, and 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 there's you can go and read it and, and meditate on it, and it's it's his preaching that that he had preached a few times before, but then when he preached it to uh, this congregation in Enfield, Connecticut. Revival broke out. People were clinging to the rafters of the building and the poles, crying that, that they feel that hell is about to open up and swallow them. And, and, and the revival was birthed there and just and swept through the land. But amidst all of that, he said, well, where there was much zeal and much passion, he said this, there is nothing belonging to Christian experience that is more liable to a corrupt mixture than zeal. Lukewarmness in religion is abominable. 
And zeal is an excellent grace. Right? He's not playing down the importance of zeal here. He's playing up our carefulness around it. He says, yet, zeal, above all other Christian virtues, needs to be strictly watched and searched. For it is zeal which corruption, and particularly pride and passion, is exceedingly apt to mix unobserved. It's very easy, he's saying, when we're zealous to make excuses for other sins. Of course I was mean, but I'm zealous. I'm, I'm here for the truth. Of, of course I called him a, a terrible name. Of course I've, I've been uh, 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 impatient and I don't give money and I'm not gracious and I don't help people and I don't pray much, but I'm getting work done in zeal. I'm on fire. Expect me to burn a few people in carelessness. But, but Edwards is saying, where there is zeal, we have to watch it carefully. Not that, not that he ever, ever drew back from a life that was entirely zealous. He was a hard worker, a hellfire preacher, but he was filled with love. And this was his, his warning. Let us take heed to it. This is, of course, he, was, he said that while commenting on 1 Corinthians 13. It was verse 3 that he wrote that, that uh, paragraph about, which says in the Words of Paul, if I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So let us not ever settle to define love without zeal for good works. That's just affection and it is very, very cheap. But let us also never Settle with zeal for good works without genuine love for man and for God, our Savior. <clears throat> and so this is what our, the character of those who are, who are working these good works. We are those who have been born again. And we are those who are zealous and careful, learning to do them. Devoted are the different phrases that Paul uses. <clears throat> Let's look down at verse uh, 14. I want to look now specifically in order to be helpful and most practical. I want to ask, what are the character of good work? What does he mean when he says good works? Because we could all define it differently. Uh, we could all define, even as 1 Corinthians 13 suggested, we could make a big list of the things we're doing, and Paul would say it's not actually good works because it's not done in love. So what are these good works? Let's, let's look at them a little bit. I've got first here, benevolence and charity. Works of benevolence and charity, which, which benevolence is just a, a good treatment and kindness and generosity to mankind, and charity being, you know, that old word for, for love and giving, you know, mercy ministries, the, the giving and the open hand to those who are in need. I say, pardon me, I say this because Paul uh, brackets, when he speaks of good works in chapter 3, he brackets them with with. Uh, with what those good works do. So look at verse 8 again. He says that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So good works are profitable for people. The people around you should be profiting, having their needs met because you are zealous for good works. So we don't get to define those as only private things done for ourselves, to ourselves, on our own. Good works are felt, needs are met, they profit other people who receive them. And down in 14, he says, so as to help, uh, yeah, we'll read the whole verse, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. And then because he knows how apt we are to self-define what good works are, he says, and, uh, sorry, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. So urgent needs being met is what Paul means by us living in good works. So this, this helps us to define it a bit more, and that's why I'm, I'm going to say that it's, it's benevolence and charity. Good works fulfill needs around you. That is definitive of good works. Good works fulfill the needs around you. <clears throat> it's God's grace that he commands works and he never leaves us without opportunities to do them. Well, those things that he commands to do, we, also, we always find lying close at hand a convenient 
uh, need that we can overstep and ignore or put the text into practice and do. And to see this in this clever way in Titus, go to verse 12, the beginning of our uh, text this morning. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. There's really not much application here other than Paul saying, Titus, you're there for a while, then I'm going to send another replacement, either Tychicus or Artemis. We, uh, they're going to come. They're obviously other ministry protégés. They're going to replace you, but I need you with me. Uh, come to me at Nicopolis, which is probably, there's a whole bunch of Nicopolises uh, in the Adriatic and Mediterranean Sea, but probably this one was just on the west of Greece, nearby to, uh, uh, Crete, where Paul was going to spend the winter. He wanted to be with Titus. Do, uh, but then he says, Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack Nothing. Tradition tells us, and, and the, the likelihood is that uh, Zenos and Apollos are the ones carrying the letter of Titus. They're coming from Paul to the churches. They're going to give the letter to Titus. And the commandment is, make sure these people are zealous for good works. Here's a test. Got a brother and a, uh, got two brothers here who need their needs met. Will they put into practice, the, these churches of Crete, under the leadership of Titus and the, and the new eldership put in place, will they send off these brothers in need with all of their needs met? Because the very next verse says, be zealous for good works, meeting urgent needs. And so really for the church of Crete, as they sit down and they open up their study Bible and they join in a circle, what does this verse mean to you? And, and, and how do you think we might apply this in our lives and our study? If, if one of them didn't rise up and say, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say, I think we should fill the pockets of Zenos and Apollos. I think we should cook them some meals, give them some cloaks and make sure they're going to get safely back to Paul, if anybody didn't agree with that with a hearty amen, they, they had to rip that page out of Titus. It's obvious there, and, and I find that this is the grace of God to us as well. If we seek to, and if we are honest about seeking, for this is the test, if we hear the good works that we should be devoted to, zealous for, careful to learn, the test is, do we really look around and start acting do we just lift up our eyes from our Bible and look at our brothers and sisters and start asking around, is there need in your life? Is there anywhere I can help? Uh, maybe you don't have a whole lot of cash to just throw, but you have skills you can help. Maybe, maybe you don't have a lot of anything, but you've got a lot of time. And there's, there's single mums or there's, there's, there's new mums or there's those in need who just need some help. There's, there's always, always opportunities to meet urgent needs in the church. So maybe you need to pull a digging aside or, or, or send an email in and just wonder, is there any way I can help? This really is Christian maturity. While, while we want to define it as, as sound doctrine and, and, and being one of the elders that Titus will appoint and, and being one of the ones sent over to Crete to lead multiple, multitudes of churches, Christian maturity to Paul is somebody asking this question, how can I help? When we do that, we find Titus, that the whole epistle starts landing in our lives properly. Spurgeon said this, You who know Jesus Christ, you will take home this exhortation if you are serious about it, and you will say, each one to himself or herself, what more can I do for Jesus? How can I walk more worthy of my profession? How can I be careful to maintain Good, uh, zeal for good work. So let, let each of us ask that. Let each of us look around and apply. And, and I spend time on this because Paul is commanding me here as the preacher. He's saying, insist on these things. Repeat these things. Or as, as Peter said, I'm just reminding you to stir you up to action. I know you know this. I felt this love. I see this love. I glory in God for the love that we have amongst each other in this church. And, and let me stir it up even more until Jesus comes back. That people would look on, that people would see the love Love of Jesus on fire here through zeal for good works. <clears throat> so that's number one. The character of these good works is benevolence and charity. The second I want to put in here, while not explicitly in the text, holiness in personal religion. Holiness in personal religion. 
If we give a whole bunch of, of to-do lists and good suggestions and applicable uh, 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 takeaway points here today, and you try and do them, but you neglect this, you will become, you'll, you'll tire yourself out, you'll become weary and annoyed at yourself because you will neglect holiness in personal religion. And what I mean by that is the simple uh, uh, T-shirt and jeans of the Christian life, the, the everyday building blocks of Christian maturity. Prayer to the Lord for strength. Continual confession of sin and repentance of sinful mindsets and actions as you work through the Word of God, maybe in the morning, maybe in the evening, maybe on your, on your break at some point, are you in the Word with the Lord, seeking repentance and confession of sin and, and, an, and a new sanctification for the day ahead of you? Are, you? are you in prayer for the church body and for your brothers and sisters? Are you, are you careful to, on, on the self-watch of, of keeping an eye on, on what, uh, what personality traits or what old habits are creeping back in? Are you, are you, this is what John Owen would say. Are you, are you daily in the act of mortifying your sin? A, a fancy word for killing. Are you daily killing your sin? Because it every day wants to jump off that cross and strangle you. It is dead on the tree, but keep it there. Keep it there. Holiness in personal religion. The, the fellowship with the saints that is more than just how you're doing, good thanks. That is praying for one another, spending time together. These, these basics of personal religion will kill our pride and our pretense as we seek to do good works. We won't give expecting some big certificate. We won't, we won't serve in order to get the eyes of our common man. We will serve because Jesus is so good to us and we are overflowing with his love and good works. <clears throat> so holiness in personal religion. And lastly, look at verse 14. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. We've seen that. So as to help cases of urgent need. We've seen that. We've spoken of making sure this is all done from a heart that is holy in personal religion and relationship to Jesus. But he says here, and not be unfruitful. Or another word there could be unproductive. This means that for Paul, those who are active in good works are not just people who, who speak a lot about good works or who plan a lot for good works and good deeds and ministries and ways of serving. He's saying, are you productive? That is, are you completing tasks? for your neighbors, or just always offering? Are you, are you completing jobs in order to serve the ministry, or just always wondering how you could do something? Are, are you starting, working on, and finishing jobs? And this, this could just be anything and everything. Maybe it's, maybe it's physical labor for friends. Maybe it's words of encouragement. We're all gifted in different ways. But Paul's mindset here, remember, this is, this is what he said about the false teachers. They're unproductive. This is what he said in verse 9 about uh, irrelevant theological controversies. He said they don't make people productive. They're unproductive. If something, we, we should define it this way, if something is unproductive, it is unchristian. This doesn't mean that we don't spend time on our knees in prayer and ask ourselves, well, I'm not, I'm not producing anything. I should do work instead. No, prayer is work that brings produce uh, I'm not saying we always have to, be, have to be moving and workaholics, but I'm saying what we're doing should always be with the aim of actually producing outcomes. There is a tendency to think of God, the Father, as a florist. You know that Jesus said in chapter 15 that his father is the vine dresser and Jesus is the vine and, and that everybody who is in him, every branch that comes from him, that's, that's us, we will produce fruit. And if we don't, he clips us off. But, but, but the reality is that where there is fruit in the Christian life, uh, and, and maybe we would think of this as being task-oriented, where there is things getting done and produce being produced, there will also be flowers. This is how fruit comes about. A flower is pollinated. And, and this is my imagery here, that, that the life that is fruitful is also pleasant. It, it has an aroma. It, it, it's got a sweet smell of Christ-likeness. But 
A branch that produces only flowers tempts itself to think that the Lord will have another use for it other than being burned with the briars. We have this temptation often to think not so much about productivity and fruitfulness, but, but simply looking to the flower of the Christian life. Oh, when I'm around this person, I just, I just always feel better. And, oh, you know, they're, they're just soft and they never rebuke me and, and they've never said anything I disagree with. And maybe that's, maybe that's the church you want to go to. Maybe that's the, the preacher on TV. And I've always got huge smiles, pearly whites. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a good sense of the Christian life having flowers. There is a bad sense where we settle for the flower without the fruit. And it's tempting. We want God to be a florist who will use us, but he says without fruit, we are clipped off. Productivity, produce. We want God to respect the fact that we are a, a field that looks very picturesque, but we are not producing a crop. The Lord Jesus showed us what he did to that, that pretty, beautiful, green, shade-giving fig tree that symbolized fruitless Israel. He went to it, green, flourishing, beautiful, flowers, shade. Hang a swing off it, spend some time there, it'll be beautiful. But there was no fruit, so he cursed it and it burned eventually. That is us. We need to realize that without producing fruit, good works that come to completion, we are that unfruitful vine, however pretty we might seem to be to the world or to our brothers and sisters. Let me, let me emphasize here as we close out that, that the greatest of good works, the greatest of fruit that we can bear is the good works and the fruit, the production of souls saved for Jesus Christ. Now, now we know, if we remember John 15, Jesus tells us, without him you can do no good thing. It is not in our power to urge, to pressure, to, to be good enough in order to produce souls saved for Christ. This is not a factory line. This is not something within our power. But, but as you think about good works lived for Jesus, let your mind constantly be asking yourself, have I brought, brought with me into the kingdom of God's free grace other sinners? This is, this is how Paul pictured himself. He did not want to be that, that man returning from the battle with no plunder. He didn't want to be the, the, the harvester coming back into the house without a harvest, a sheave pile behind him. We want to be those. I, I urge you to be those. As you think of good works, think primarily of those highest good works, which is bringing lost brothers and sisters home. Are you speaking the gospel as, as best you know how, as, as, as gently and bold and lovingly and firmly and, and desperately and respectfully as you know how around the Christmas table? around the, the, the birthday table with your family, on, on, the, on any activity you have on social media with those co-workers? Are you praying for opportunities for hearts to be opened and the light of God's love in Christ Jesus to shine in? The winning of souls is the chiefest good work and we should always seek to do them. Paul finishes very aptly, very fittingly here in the book of Titus <clears throat> with this phrase, Grace be with you all. Grace has been a main theme in this book. We heard it back in, in uh, verse 4 of chapter 1. When he said, Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. That's where grace comes from. From the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you are not a Christian who has been born again, who is zealous for good works, who has the assurance that in Jesus is your life, that on the cross as he died, he died for your sin. If Jesus is an abstract figure or a person that is talked about but not a king who is known personally, if the Holy Spirit has not filled you and begin working in you a, a love of Scripture, a love of your brothers and sisters, a love of Jesus Christ, then you are outside of him. You are unsaved. You don't have the grace of God, but this grace of the Father is offered in Jesus Christ. We saw over in chapter 2, verse 11, that he said that the grace of God appeared bringing salvation. 
This grace is, is Jesus incarnate. That's the grace of God for you. We saw also that grace in verse 7 of chapter 3 is that which justifies us. So friend, if, if you don't have the grace of God today, you can pass into right standing with God, that's justification, through His grace. You can be saved no matter what sort of person you are because he, the grace brought salvation for all people. You can come into relationship with the triune God despite your sin because grace is here for all. But trust in Jesus. And those who have, let us glory in God. That is he who has given us grace, that grace is given to train us in sound doctrine and toward good works for the glory of Jesus Christ. It was all done for you. It will all be completed in you by God. Let us rest in that. Seek to strive forwards in good works and bless the world and one another. Let's pray as we finish off this epistle. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy and favor and undeserved kindness towards us. And we thank you, God, that this is not simply a, a vague sense that we get from looking up at the, at the starry sky, but it's a person. You incarnated grace. John said that in him we have grace upon grace. We thank you, Lord, that you have come down to us in the person of Jesus Christ to commune with us, to mediate us to yourself, to save us, to do away with our sins, to pay our punishment, to take our condemnation, to produce a righteousness, to bring us into your family, to send then your Holy Spirit upon us and make us zealous for works like Jesus Christ was. I thank you, God, for this body who has, who has come to know Jesus by faith, who works by your Holy Spirit more and more to to, to image his likeness to the world. And we pray, God, that you would, as you did in the churches of Crete under Titus, that you would make us more and more, however painful it becomes, however much sacrifice it takes, that you would make us a soul-winning church that is overflowing with good works to each other and to the world. We pray this, Lord, and we thank you for your grace. Thank you that we can be forgiven by nothing else than the forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ shown to us in his dying for sinners. We thank you and glorify you. And it is in the name of Jesus, our strong King, Savior, Lord, crucified Lamb and Lion, that we pray all of these things. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.